Okay. Well, hi everyone. I hope you're having a great day. My name is Alper. I'm the Education Content Manager for this year's Code Day Labs. Um, I'm happy to welcome Nick Lincoln Smith, um, who will be talking to you guys about open source uh, mixed reality engine stereo kit. Um, and Nick works at Microsoft. So if you have any questions regarding that and building open source technologies, you can also ask him that. Um, Nick, if you'd like to give a short intro about yourself and then we can get started. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm Nick, Nick Klingensmith. Uh, I actually come from game development originally. I've been doing uh, game development since I was 12. Uh, so I, I've since then uh, done, a, done a bunch of other things. Um, like uh, tool building and yeah, mostly mostly tool building since then. I, I, I went from doing game development to building game development tools. And now I work with mixed reality and I'm still kind of building tools within that. Uh, so that's, that's me. I currently work at Microsoft on the uh, mixed reality middleware team um, and work on StereoKit. Is it anything you wanted to go over uh, after this or shall I dive right in? You can get started, it's all good. Okay, cool. So uh, today I wanted to talk to you all about StereoKit, especially in the context of open source. Uh, so this is actually, I, I guess it's not technically my first open source project, but it is uh, one of the few open source projects that I've done. But at this point it's, it's three years old, so it's a pretty big one. Uh, so I've learned a lot over the years uh, about like, uh, like how to how to build a good open source tool, how to adjust to that environment and optimize for it. Uh, but then I've also done a lot of tool development in the past before that that was not open source. Uh, it was more like source available. Uh, so um, just a kind of a, a quick overview of some of the things that I've done. So uh, like I mentioned, I, I come from game development. Um, I've mostly been involved with independent game development. So I, I've I've done a lot of small games myself. Uh, I worked for. Uh, independent game studios doing like contract work on a, a number of different things. I think the biggest company I've actually worked at was uh, Zynga. And at Zynga, I actually spent most of my time there doing kind of independent work in uh, some of their prototyping and research labs. And so Zynga was actually where I got a lot of my uh, initial XR experience. So we had a, a VR department there that ran for about a year, maybe a little longer, but that was like right at the start of uh, commercial VR. So like the Vive and the Oculus CV1 had just released at that point in time. So I got to do a lot of really early uh, experimentation with VR, like uh, how do you do locomotion? Like how do you make things interesting or fun? Uh, so that was that was really awesome and amazing. Um, but uh, when when I do a lot of my independent work, like when when I'm not working for somebody on a game, what I tend to do is just kind of build tools for other people. Like it's, it's kind of what I fall back to when I'm not paying attention to what I'm doing. You know, like sometimes I like to think like, oh, yeah, I, I, I really like making games. But after a certain point, it was like, well, actually, when I sit down to write the games, do I actually write a game? Uh, I, I actually end up spending much more time building tools for those games. And so. Uh, I actually, once I realized this, I, I started like doubling down on this and I actually made a, a pretty decent living on the Unity asset store for a good number of years. So like a uh, fair 2D uh, down in the bottom left corner here was uh, one of my uh, primary winners. Like I still see this one all over the place. Uh, I think recently Rogue Legacy 2 in particular uh, used fair 2D for a lot of their level design, which is really cool. You know, uh, it's really nice to be able to go places and, and see your code in use. Uh, to, to make really good stuff. So I'm, I'm really passionate about uh, development tools. One of my big things is, is kind of like, how do I make smaller groups of people more productive? Uh, I, I've always been interested, especially in how do I make myself uh, incredibly productive? And this has always been kind of through tools. Tools are my answer. Uh, so that's that's a little bit about me. That's where I come from. That's what I do. Uh, now, what is a, what is a stereo kit? Um, so maybe you've read the description a little bit. Uh, maybe you're kind of guessing from, from the description here. But it's basically a mixed reality engine or library. I, I'm still not entirely sure if it's an engine or a library. Uh, but basically, uh, you know, I, I, I was working with the tools that I had available to me, and I just didn't find them quite enough. Uh, and so I really wanted to make something that was fun to use to create mixed reality experiences and very easy to create mixed reality experiences. So this is mixed reality first. like. It doesn't do flat screen, it doesn't do console, it, it doesn't even do phone AR. This is like specifically for headset-based uh, XR stuff. 
Um, and because of this, the scope, like I scoped it down to this specific thing. And so it's really good at that. Um, it's very good at those things. Uh, the API is very focused around that sort of environment. And so it's much nicer to use for these things. So mixed reality all the way, first and foremost. And, and this really helps me build a, a nice, nice little library here. So that's, th this was, this video was actually recorded back in, in V2, which V0 to 2, which at this point may be a year or two old. Uh, so like, it's, it's actually a lot further than, than what you see here, but this is just kind of like the nicest summary video that I have of it. Um, you know, like, it, the nice thing is this is based on OpenXR, and so it works everywhere. Like this is a, a quest, uh, but I work for Microsoft, and so my primary platform is the the Hololens. Um, you know, it, it's these standalone headsets in particular because they're these more constrained environments where they're mobile GPUs, limited processing power, battery based, and all that fun stuff. So I had to be really optimized with how I built the code. So you know, this is this is like using the uh, Oculus pass through stuff. This is doing like hand tracking. There's a nice, like all of this user interface stuff see, that you see here is like built into the engine that you could just use it right away. Like it's really simple to do. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's not just VR. I, I did spend a lot of time working in AR as well, like headset based AR. Like this is, I, I think, the most interesting case for. Uh, stereo kit uh, is is an augmented reality uh, place. Like I, I love VR from uh, a game development standpoint, from an immersion perspective, uh, but AR I think is the more practical daily driver sort of scenario where you're being productive with a computer on your head sort of thing. Like honestly, when when you try a headset and you have the the pass through experience, or if you put on an AR headset and you can see through uh, the glass. Like it's it's just much more comfortable um, being in a, a real environment while also having the the digital world available to you. So all of these things are like built into Stereo Kit. You can do with like just a few lines of code. And and of course VR. Uh, yeah, I do actually spend a lot of time. Ooh, does that have audio? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I was recording that with Spotify on in the background. But this is you know this is um, like a giant. Uh, open world, procedurally generated um, sort of landscape, and, and so I just wanted to just show that you know Stereo can can do these kind of small user interface based uh, experiences, but can also you know go into the game development and more immersive worlds if you wanted to do that sort of thing too. So it's not just uh, apps and stuff like that. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. So one of the interesting things about Stereo Kit is that it's it's code first, uh, so there's no uh, editor that you get with this, it's, it's really just like you write some code, you plug it into Visual Studio and it just goes. So like this, this top one here, like this, this chunk of code, like, you know, you initialize stereo kit, you load a model and then every frame of the application, you draw that model. And, and this is the whole thing. Like that's the whole application. Like you don't have this, this huge engine in the background. You don't have a lot of this overhead or this complicated stuff going on. Like that's it. Um, if you're a programmer, this is kind of nice. Like this is actually uh, really exciting to, to me, especially if you're a designer, this may not be quite so appealing, but one of the big things is that I, I focused a lot on being able to create interfaces. So like down here, this is how you create a, a regular sort of window based UI. You know, you begin a window, you add a button there. If somebody clicked a button, do a thing, you know? And so if you are a developer working with designers, it's very easy to stand up a user interface that is specific to your application. And, you know, like after spending a lot of time in the industry building, you know, applications and games uh, like this, you know, at some point, you know, the editor that you're provided with just isn't enough anyhow. Like you have to end up extending your editor a whole lot in order to do really good things. Um, and, and some of the games that I've worked on didn't even use the editor. Like the editor was just getting in the way of, of all the stuff that we were trying to accomplish. So in many ways, I, I really like this uh, approach a lot better is just like having the opportunity to sit down and design the user experience of the library itself uh, through code. Like that allows me to create a really nice API for, for doing cool stuff like this. Uh, and one of the nice things also about building uh, a code-based user interface or user experience, this, this ruler here is just a piece of code. Uh, you know, like you don't have to read this down here. You can just take a look at the, uh, like the, just the, the packaging of it. You can copy this code. Uh, you can send it in an email. You can send this in a text message. You can post this on a forum and anybody can copy that, paste it into their project 
and have this ruler there as well. Um, and that's actually really, really powerful because a lot of the, the current game engines are, are kind of like a whole collection of different things. You know, like you have a, you know, a game object which has multiple different scripts on it. So all of a sudden, like with that by itself, you already have like multiple pieces of code uh, and a game object with metadata about how these things are oriented and like how they relate to each other with you know these links that are not through the code so if, if you're a programmer and you're used to like looking at code and like following the the references and everything like that like a game engine doesn't have those in, in a lot of the, the occasions not to mention how do you copy and paste a game object you know like that doesn't send through an email at all uh, nor can you like copy and paste that from stack overflow so like the this code first experience does have some advantages here as well so very happy about that too. Um, I have also spent a lot of time with the documentation for StereoKit. Uh, one of the big obstacles here to, to adoption is like, if I adopt this library, what is the experience going to be like for me? Like, am I going to be hunting all over the place for like, how do I do this? Or like, you know, how do I solve this problem? You know, what, what's up? Like, how do I even learn this thing? You know, Unity has this powerful advantage in that it has so much history, like, you know, I don't know, 10, 20 years worth of, of documentation on the internet. Um, and so in order to have uh, a good alternative, uh, you really need to pay attention to the documentation, make sure that people like it when they see it, that they can learn something. And, and so I've, I've spent a lot of time, like all of the, the docs are auto-generated, so I don't have to maintain them manually for the most part. Like all of the code here, like this is literally part of the engine test test case. And, and so like, I know that this code all works. Um, there's a little chunk of code down below here that will actually take a screenshot of this code in action. And all of this is built into the code adjacent to it. So if I refactor this code, I know I can go back and look at this text and review it. Um, and then I have a tool that just scrapes all this stuff together, including those screenshots, and then builds them into the docs page. So this page right here, this is literally this chunk of code that you see over here. And so that makes it really nice for me to maintain, keep up to date. You know, like I, I can guarantee that this code works because I see this screenshot that was generated literally from this code, all that fun stuff. Um, and, and so like documentation is hugely important to me for, for StereoKit because that really sells the, the tool. It really helps developers use the tool. Like it's honestly, I, I consider um, the documentation and the tool to be inseparable from each other. Like they're, they're both part of the same product. Okay, so that's, that's what StereoKit is. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about like why I built it and a little bit about the open source side of it. Like why, why I chose to go that route and how I do it. Um, and I, I do say Q&A, um, definitely ask your questions. I'll answer them at the end, uh, but please, any questions that you have, de definitely toss them in there. Okay, so <clears throat> the first thing, uh, this was an experience that I had uh, doing tools for the Unity Asset Store. Uh, so this is, these are three different tools that I published. I, I have a couple more that I've published as well, but these all had kind of notable experiences for me that really shaped how I develop tools now. Uh, so the first one here, like fair 2D on the left, um, like I spent, I actually spent a couple of years working on this tool and it's, it's really good. Like it's, it's amazing. Like I still see it when I go to GDC, like games all over the place there, you know, just, just spot it in that booth, in this booth, any sort of two-dimensional, like free form sort of level design sort of stuff. It's, it's very common in there, but uh, at some point Unity came along, looked at it and said like, that's really neat, uh, we'll take this. Um, and so they basically cloned it and released it for free as an extension to Unity. And, you know, it's like, I spent a couple of years on this. Like I, I spent a lot of effort, I made it really good. Mine is still better than theirs uh, at this point. As far as I understand, people still will come back and say like, mm, fair to be still better. Um, but the problem is, Unity released it for free and it's now a Unity official sort of thing. And so I can't really compete with that, you know, uh, like I can no longer justify maintaining it because how do I compete with free? So this, this was kind of an interesting thing. Like I wasn't selling it for all that much. It was like 30 bucks uh, a license for that. Uh, so like you, you could just like buy it for 30 bucks, it's yours, you know, like it, that's super cheap. It's super accessible, especially for all that it does, but you know, still can't compete with zero. Uh, the second one here in the middle, uh, this was Supercube, and you know, it, at, at its core, it's kind of like a white boxing tool where you, uh, you know, just have cubes. You lay out your your level, and this this can help you with your 
early stages of level design. It's designed to be like really fast for putting things together. It's moderately optimized. It does a really good job with basic UVs. Like it's not necessarily meant for finished product, um, but it's really, really good for prototyping. It also has a, a couple of really neat features regarding uh, vertex colors and preservation of vertex colors, especially because of some of my other tools. And you'll see that in a moment here. But uh, this was actually a chart topper for the first month of release. Like uh, when I released it, it was at the very top of the asset store for a whole month. And I was so happy with that. Unfortunately, um, somebody saw it and was like, oh, that's really cool. That's easy to do. And they basically cloned all the surface level functionality, like all the things that you look at and you go, oh, it does X, Y, and Z. And like, it actually does X, Y, Z plus the whole alphabet of details afterwards. Uh, so they, they cloned the X, Y, Z part, left out all the details, and they released that for free. So, you know, I, I guess I probably shouldn't have tackled something that was so easy at its surface level. And it was kind of a little difficult to um, like message some of the details that it really takes care of underneath. But I, I, I honestly didn't make sales after that person released their free tool. So that was, that was very insightful, right? Like, you know, I, I had this brief moment of success, like the, the tool is good. I, I had proof of that. Uh, but my business model just didn't work in this particular case because of uh, their ability to clone it so rapidly. Uh, not to mention Unity had no protections against that either. Uh, like they're, in, in theory, they kind of like recommend that you don't publish things for free, but you know, what, what, can, what can you do? Um, you know, the, the big problem is like once something is free, it's it's tough to maintain it. Like you can't justify maintaining this. So Faircube, Supercube would have been like still the better option because I would have been able to maintain it over time because it still generated revenue, but not after that. The last one here uh, on the right, this was uh, Vertex Painter. Um, and this was basically like, uh, I kind of had like a prototype tool for, for this a, a long time ago. And I really liked the user interface and the user experience of it. Like it was really, really nice, uh, a lot of fun to, to, to work with. And so I, I had done my research. I looked at the store. There were a couple of competing products and I was like, I can do better than these, you know? So I'm going to enter the market here with a competing tool and see how we fare. Um, yeah, it, it did a lot of really nice stuff. I, I spent a lot of time, like I'm, I'm really good at, at extending Unity's editor at this point, you know, since I have this, so many tools before this. So I, I nailed the experience of it. The problem was, as soon as I released it, Unity bought the company that owned my competitors and released their stuff for free. So once again, uh, Unity has eaten my lunch trying to sell stuff on the asset store. I, I don't know how I could have seen that one coming. Like it, it looked like a pretty safe area to be competing in. Uh, and honestly, um, Unity didn't buy my competitor for their vertex painting tool. They bought my competitor for their um, level design tools. So this was kind of just like collateral in between. Like, well, oh, we're just gonna make your whole portfolio free. So, like, so so after this, like, I, I just kind of decided, like, okay, if I'm if I'm publishing stuff and, and tools, like, I really can't count on Unity as being my only source of revenue. Like, revenue, like Unity is just gonna eat my lunch at, at some point or another here, um, and I just have to diversify a little bit better, plan my business strategy here a, a little better. So uh, this was actually around when I joined Microsoft, you know, after that many different things, like you, you kind of <laughs> got to take a break in some form or another. So I, I joined Microsoft and I joined the mixed reality team. Uh, this was around the time that we were launching HoloLens 1. So uh, I was I joined in kind of an evangelism capacity. So like I, I'm really good at doing presentations, hosting events, all that fun stuff. And so I was uh, an evangelist for Microsoft Mixed Reality. And uh, like I, I had two notable experiences here at, at the very start. Um, the, the first one was doing Spectator View. I worked on Spectator View for the HoloLens 2. Basically like when you have an application and you take a phone and synchronize the uh, coordinate spaces of these two things and observe what the other person is doing over the network. So this one here on the left is a HoloLens application, just like a basic mind mapping sort of thing, but it had a spectator view integration. And I would take this around to conferences and show it off. Uh, the issue here was that this was a HoloLens and a phone, and I had to deploy to both of these things with Unity. And that took hours. Like, if I wanted to make a build and test this on device with the networking, it literally would take me like two to three hours to, to do a full build. 
this was this was absolutely soul crushing, especially like when you're trying to to race your your deadline to the conference. Like you know, conferences don't move. You can't push a conference back just for your demo. So this was like hard deadline stuff with with uh, this really atrocious build system. So I promised myself like I would never develop directly on Hololens ever again because that was just way too much build time involved. Um, the next tool that I built was the mixed reality lighting tools. And this was actually my, my first real open source project. So Mixed Reality Lighting Tools is an open source um, Unity editor extension or Unity extension. And it basically like looks at the room that you're in and scans it and replicates that lighting inside of your Unity scene. Um, and I, I basically went out of my way to make sure that I could do this inside of the Unity editor. So I actually like wrote native extensions to access the gyroscope while running on a laptop. And so this, this video that you're seeing here is actually like me taking my laptop webcam and rotating it around to, to capture the, the images here. Uh, but this worked on device. Um, the experience of, of building in the editor and not on device really helped a lot. Um, but there were there were still some obstacles. Like it, it was it was much better than than deploying to device though. And since then, I've had one or two more experiences that honestly were like so so much worse. Um, there there's just a lot of pitfalls when you're trying to do mixed reality development at the moment, and and uh, yeah, you just fall all over them at some point. So the the last kind of straw here was um, I did the Hololens uh, porting hacks. Uh, basically, I traveled around the planet and helped partners port from HoloLens 1 to HoloLens 2. So like th this picture is actually like uh, over in Japan at one of these hacks. It was a really fantastic experience. But you know, it, this was towards the tail end of it. And I had met so many people that were just having so many issues with Unity and, and that sort of stuff. And I, I, I couldn't solve them. Like they weren't like, you know, problems that you can go oh, just like, write better code or whatever like literally like the engine just does not do these things well or doesn't surface them nicely like trying to do a hackathon for hololens and unity requires almost a full day of setup you know like that's that's absolutely insane you can't do a hackathon like that you know um and uh you know fortunately around this time uh open xr had actually just kicked off so this was about three years ago and microsoft released the 0 0.9 runtime uh, I had kind of been gravitating away from uh, Unity related stuff. So I'd been working in native code. Uh, I did some tutorials for the Azure, the Connect for Azure uh, at the time. And so uh, when OpenXR came out, I was like, oh, that sounds really great. Let me go write a tutorial on that. And so this, this one on the left here, this is, you know, it's just a pile of boxes, but this is just C++, like raw C, C++. It is 700 lines of code. You know, this is, you know, creating Windows, this is initializing OpenXR, this is doing direct 3D11. And that's, I fit in uh, 700 lines of code. And I'm like, wow, that's kind of cool. Um, and even better, this could deploy to a HoloLens in less than 10 seconds. That was, that was magical. You know, being able to, to go from like these, these huge, like 15 minutes for hello world, just for the deploy time to down to 10 seconds. Like I, I, understood finally just how much overhead was on the table here for for picking up uh and so that's like the the hotel room that i took this picture from was was literally the where the first line of uh, stereo code was written um made possible by openxr i couldn't do this before openxr oh, openxr like if i didn't have that I, i'd have to kind of like write multiple vr backends and that would be a pain so very thankful for that um, okay. Okay. So, all right. So now we've, we've gone through like, that's, that's why I made stereo kit. Um, so, okay. So this is basically an alternative to something like unity or unreal. That's, that's a big ask. How do you do that? Um, and yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've spent a lot of time doing, uh, hackathons, game jam, stuff like that. And so I understand working in small teams, uh, during really tight deadlines and the big thing that you have to learn is scope. Uh, take it, cut it down, cut it down some more, and then cut it down a little further. So like, if I'm gonna take this on, I really have to get the perfect scope that lets me do this. And I, I think I found a really nice balance here. Um, especially like, this, this is just me. Like I can't ask somebody to take on Unity and I, I can't expect people to spend their time doing this sort of thing. So this has to be just, just me as a side project sort of thing. So it has to be really scoped, right? 
So I, I kind of came out with a, a, a couple of rules uh, that were like, these are the things that I, I want to focus on for the, uh, the engine. The first thing is it has to be specifically mixed reality. Like um, if, if I expand it too far out from this, it becomes way more work, you know? Like, so this is specifically for, for mixed reality headsets. The, the ones, like I've said before, like I don't even do phone AR or anything like that. It has to be like open XR um, in order for, for this to work. Uh, and so that helped a lot. That, that really kept things simple, especially towards the beginning. Um, and, you know, it, it also really shapes the API a lot too, because when it is this focused on mixed reality, you can make a couple of um, assumptions with the API that you expose. Uh, the other thing, keeping it simple, you know, like it, it, it's, it's kind of a broad statement, but it's also, you know, uh, really important. Like you, you can't sit down and say like, let's, let's make something complicated. Uh, like let's, let's go high level here. Like let's add these rich features. Like just, just keep it simple, as simple as you possibly can, because this is still going to take years. Um, so I, I, I do things like uh, using C instead of C++ or like, like I've removed the editor. There's no editor for this. It's just the code first thing. Uh, you know, the, I, I don't have these high level entity component systems or even a scene graph. Like I have alternatives to that that are simpler. Um, so there, there was a lot of things that I could do here. Uh, making it fun. Uh, yeah, this, this was just kind of like, this is also kind of nebulous, but it's kind of a, a benchmark that I keep in the back of my head. Like, is this still fun to do? Um, like, is it fun for me to type this, uh, to implement this feature? Um, because, you know, this is, this is mixed reality. If it isn't fun, something has to be wrong, right? Um, so that, that's, that's a rule for me, and I, I keep it in mind. Uh, I also, I didn't want it to be just for games. Like we already have a couple of game engines out there that do mixed reality. If I'm just saying like, this is also a game engine, then that's that's less of, a, less of a difference. That puts me more in their camp and I have to compete more directly with them. Instead, I say, this is specifically for apps and can also do games. So apps first. And, and when you actually sit down and say apps first, you design the APIs differently again. Um, like there are significant architectural differences with StereoKit uh, that are different routes than a game engine would take. Like for example, the asset pipeline is completely runtime. Like if, if you want to load a GLTF at runtime, StereoKit will do it. Like you can grab it from a URL, you can grab it from a file picker. Um, it'll open it up, it'll process it asynchronously in the background, it'll load it up piece by piece, it'll optimize it as it goes. And you know that's, that's something that doesn't happen in a game engine. A game engine really has to sit down, go through a compile step and optimize those assets in advance. And you know, if you want to ship that during runtime, you got to write another loader that works at runtime. And you know, I, I've, I've encountered so many people that were just like writing their own asset loaders and getting them wrong. Uh, and these were causing problems for their applications. So like that's, it's a tough task to do and I don't want to force people through that. So like I, I make these decisions about like, here's how an app would do it. Um, let's make it good for this. Performance by default. This is also really important for the mobile headsets. You know, it's really easy to take a game engine, toss in subsurface scattering or some ambient occlusion or you know, these, these heavy post-processing effects and absolutely tank your frame rate. And it's like so easy to do. Like it, it takes one click to absolutely destroy your frame rate in, in a game engine. Um, and so stereo kit, you know, I, I just kind of made it so that you can't foot gun yourself, you know. Uh, all the defaults are correct for doing performance right. Uh, all the really complicated graphic stuff you have to work to add in. Um, like if if you're using stereo kit, don't, don't expect like, mind-blowing graphics, like radiosity, global illumination, whatever, like you're, you're gonna have to go to a game engine for that. But if you want it to look good and be fast, then Stereo Kit's great. Like it, it looks good enough. Um, like there's no real-time lighting or anything like that, but it does have a lighting system that looks fantastic uh, if you're okay with the uh, concessions for it. So performance by default, you're gonna hit 60 frames per second with Stereo Kit unless you're doing some really scary stuff. Uh, the other thing too is uh, user interface. You know, with with games, you kind of don't have uh, an expectation of a, a UI. Like, no two games have the same UI, so your UI has to be at a different level of abstraction. Uh, for StereoKit, because it's focused on applications, uh, I can sit down and say like, 
here's an established UI. All you have to do is just like go through, like by default, you get a really nice looking a UI. There's some theming stuff that you can do to switch it over to something like closer to the, the HoloLens themes or something like that. But basically it's, it's a lot more um, uh, narrow in, in, in how it works. So it's a lot easier to build the UI without having to worry about like doing everything custom. So that's, that's how I kind of scope this down, like th those core things. Uh, there's also a couple of other things that I do that are like, so on the technical side, like I mentioned, uh, I don't do object-oriented programming for StereoKit. Um, I, I've very much gone the functional route at this point, and I, I, I basically use C instead of C++. It is technically C++. I do use that every once in a while if it improves the clarity of the code. Uh, but for the most part, like if you, you know, all the links are followable. Like you can go from one piece of the code to the next. You will see every piece of code getting executed. And and actually, this has helped a lot. Um, I I found that I don't really write a lot of bugs this way. Uh, I haven't had issues with me memory. Like I don't I don't use pointer wrappers at all. Like no smart pointers. I just use raw pointers. But this code style works really well for that. Um, like it's just easy to follow everything. Um, like I mentioned, the, there's no visual editor. It might be nice to have one down the road at some point. And like now that we're three years in, it's it's maybe a little bit more realistic to start thinking about that sort of thing. But you know, scoping that out really helped a lot to to focus down on like the things that really matter. Um, OpenXR was kind of a limitation. I might be opening this up to WebXR in the near future as well. But uh, like again, for the first three years, just limiting it to OpenXR was a really big a win for me as far as complexity and, and keeping things simple. Uh, another thing is that StereoKit is immediate mode. Um, and basically what this means is like, if, if you think of a game engine that has like a, a scene graph with all these game objects and components and whatever, like it has this very high level representation that it stores for you. Um, StereoKit doesn't do that. Basically, if you want to model drawn on screen, you say model.draw, like you just, and you draw it every frame. Uh, so if you don't call that, it doesn't get drawn. Um, and this is actually really powerful because a lot of the time you don't need these high level abstractions. Like if you want a forest, basically you just have an array of like which tree goes where, right? And then you just loop through that array and you draw the tree there. Like you don't need a whole scene graph for that. You don't need a, a complex game object with components. All you need is an array, right? Uh, and so this allows you to kind of um, describe the complexity of your application the way that you want to. It allows you to kind of bring your own architectural um, concepts about how this, this application is architected and make it work really well. Um, so this immediate mode kind of allows you to design things your way. It's a little bit more work sometimes, uh, but it's also much simpler to think about, much less error prone. Um, then kind of like the, the development cadence and everything like this, um, the very first thing I did was make it work for the basics. Yeah, I the the first two, major version releases were actually exclusively for Windows. Um, so they worked on HoloLens and Windows Desktop. Um, and I don't remember exactly how long. I, that was probably about like a year and a half of, of development. And I just focused on getting that to work, um, being able to build a basic application using those features. Like, what do I need absolutely to make an application? And then like, I, I still add features now. Like, I don't consider it to be a 1.0 product yet because there's still a few features that are missing. Getting very close though, um, but I, I basically try to ship about two major features uh, every every single release, and I usually do a release about every two months. I try to I don't always hit it. Like I, I don't stress about those sort of things. You know, cramming is is where you get bugs and issues and bad architecture. So uh, two major features a release, uh, usually pretty good. I, I just kind of have a backlog of like these are all the major features that I really want for 1.0, and I'm just chipping away at them over time. Uh, I also uh, prioritize based off of what the community asked for. Like this, I think is a really big, important element of development, especially within open source. Um, your users will tell you what they need in order to build their applications. And I would rather prioritize what my users need right now, rather than what my concept of, you know, what is a 1.0. So like, if they say I need this feature and that's not on my 1.0 list, like doesn't matter. Like that's the more important one because they're using it right now to build their products. And I don't want to disappoint or block them from creating what they're creating. Um, 
So like being able to listen to users, having a Discord channel has been really, really valuable for me to, to just like hear what people are doing, to, to hear their feedback, to prioritize the, the features that I build. Um, and then I, I also build test projects of my own. So I, I usually build them in the form of like a tutorial project because then it's kind of like also documentation for the engine. Uh, but this is a really nice way to kind of like, you know, test out the features that I have been working on and see where Stereo Kit is lacking things or where there may be rough patches. So uh, like I have to use it in order to see these things because not everybody uh, surfaces the issues that they're running into and uh, not every issue is even clear to, to all the users. So uh, like the current project that I'm working on right now is a, a photogrammetry explorer where you basically load up a, a photogrammetry thing from Sketchfab's API and you can walk around in it. And so there's kind of like this menu, like this REST uh, interaction, this uh, teleportation through a uh, high poly environment. And yeah, that's it's tough. Like I, there's definitely some pieces in there where I'm like, I can't ship this with the current version. I still need to do a thing here or there or the other place. And uh, it's really insightful for, for really stretching the, the tool out. <clears throat> All right, so now uh, the open source part of it, talking about like, why on earth and uh, how on earth? <clears throat> so it's it's Starkit is on GitHub. It has been there for three years now and 2.3 thousand commits. Oh man, wow, <laughs> that's a bunch. Uh, and it is MIT licensed. <clears throat> and I, I actually have like, it, it isn't just me. Um, there's been at least 21 other people who've uh, tossed in a little bit of work here and there. I'm really, really thankful to all of those people who've made things uh, a, little, a little bit easier here and there. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. So I, I did want to mention the, the MIT license thing here for, for a brief moment, because I think this is clearly a, an important topic when it comes to open source. So from my experience in corporate world, uh, I know that, you know, like there's basically a list of licenses where the, the company says, like, if you need to use any of these licenses, like a software using any of these licenses, you're good to go. Like you don't have to contact legal. You don't have to do anything. Just take it and go. And that is actually a really big remover of friction because I don't I don't even know who the legal person is and, and Microsoft the, the for my team. like I, I don't I don't think I would really enjoy that interaction. Like I'm not I'm not excited about figuring all that fun stuff out. But if I know that I can just adopt an MIT license tool, great, perfect. Uh, the whole category of issue removed there. And you know, a lot of getting adoption is reducing friction. So MIT license is what I chose. It was, it was honestly not a hard choice for me. Um, yeah, like it, there's, there's not a whole lot of other great options out there. Like that's, it's just good. However, uh, the problem with an MIT license piece of software is that uh, now anybody can use it. So like if a gambling company wanted to use this or the military or like, you know, fossil fuel companies, like, you know, that's out of my hands at this point, which, you know, I, I think in my ideal world, if there was like a standardized license for uh, like MIT, but with exceptions for don't be evil sort of thing, like if there was a realistic one of those that companies were okay with, like I would have definitely chosen that. Um, but for now, like I'm, I'm just not a legal person, so I don't want to mess with that stuff. MIT is, is the way to go for me. So each person will have their own choice and those are all okay, but this is, this is why I chose mine. Uh, the other thing here, <clears throat> these are some of the reasons why I built StereoKit as an open source tool rather than like a source available or a closed source sort of thing. Uh, the big thing here, I think, is that it's, it's a good competitive distinction between uh, the other engines out there. So like uh, Unity is closed sourced. You can get it if you pay them a lot of money. Uh, Unreal is source available, uh, so you can contribute, you can look at it, and you can debug it, but you can't um, fork it or like you, you can't own it in, in any sort of way, shape, or form. And, uh, it's 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 a nice compromise, but um, it's not quite open source. Uh, Godot is great, like that's perfect, you know. Um, I think that's wonderful. But the big thing, you know, like debugability is the first one. Um, if you have an error, like I actually have source link set up. So when you have an error in Stereo Kit, you can actually drill down into the code on GitHub and see exactly where that error occurred. It's great, fantastic. Uh, so having your source available is, is critical for debugability. As far as like maintainability and extendability though, like this is kind of like this, this long-term promise. You know, if, if you have to get onto 
a weird device like you know somebody releases uh, a toaster that also does vr like you know is the maintainer going to to support toaster vr like maybe like you're not going to convince unity to, to implement that so this might be something that you have to dig in there and implement yourself because it's only worth it to you so that ability to sit down and customize it at that level is, is kind of important same thing with with lifetime you know um if you know, Unity goes under in two years because of their poor business decisions, then, you know, how do you maintain software that you've already got loose in the wild that you're supporting and improving and all that fun stuff. So having access to the open source code uh, makes it, you know, uh, something that you can maintain yourself if you really have to. And then also, yeah, just like that's that's kind of like these are the core reasons why I choose open source. It, it's not necessarily about contributors or anything like that. It's simply like this is what's best for this particular product. Um, so I, I I always think about that first, like what what is best for the product. You always have to find your niche and fit perfectly to that niche because, you know, like if if you don't, you're underutilizing your your uh, spatial advantage. Uh, so a note about external contributions. <clears throat> I love them. It's fantastic. But I didn't actually get my first major contribution until I had been working on StereoKit for a year and a half. Um, and I, I think that's kind of an important perspective to sit back and understand is that, like open source does not mean that other people will write code for you. Um, and yeah, and, uh, honestly, like still like 95% of StereoKit's code is still written by me, you know, uh, it's, it's it's very difficult to ask other people to spend their time working on a product like this. It, it's it's hard. It's a lot of work, and it's it, your time is valuable. So, you know, I honestly I'll, I'll feel guilty about asking somebody to write something. So I, I don't even do that most of the time. However, like you could in theory optimize for uh, external contributions as well. Like if I was ex optimizing for external contributions, I might write something in Rust. Uh, right now, Rust is really popular and people really love to noodle around with it. <clears throat> so like there are things that you could do if uh, getting external contributions was was important to you. Uh, like the other thing too here, like with, with this bullet point, um, I, I very much spent all of my time optimizing for the end user experience. Like how do they start with StereoKit? What's Hello World? You know, and it, for StereoKit, you basically, you grab Visual Studio templates and you grab Visual Studio and you hit run and it goes. And this is actually like very, very different from the uh, contributor experience. Like if you are trying to contribute to StereoKit, you need to like clone the repository, be able to build the, 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 the source code itself from scratch. And it has a lot of dependencies and, and weird things here and there. And, and that's a different path. And I didn't spend my time optimizing that. I spent more on the user side. The other thing too is that uh, StereoKit's primary interface is C Sharp. Uh, Golden Path is C Sharp. So when people come in from the community for StereoKit, they are C Sharp developers that work very much in that world. Whereas StereoKit's core code is C and C++. So for somebody to come in, want to contribute, they also have to have that C Sharp knowledge and the C++ knowledge and interest. Um, and so that's kind of a, a little bit of a bigger ask. So uh, StereoKit's a little bit of a trickier sell for um, asking people to contribute. And the other thing too is if somebody contributes stuff to your repository and you are the primary maintainer of that repository, then you are now responsible for that code. So this is something to keep in mind when like thinking about contributions. Like I, I've had some lovely, amazing, beautiful code come in and I've had some stuff that, that needed a little bit of work, but in the end, I, I often have to uh, maintain it, fix bugs in that code and you know, just all that fun stuff. So it's, it's, you, you have to be careful about what you accept and um, yeah, it's, it's, you're not responsible. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting element to, to keep in mind when doing this sort of thing. It wasn't something that I had really uh, thought of about that uh, at that level before doing this. Okay. And funding. Uh, so this, this is something like, because I come from uh, this entrepreneurial sort of background, like funding is really, really important here. And where does this funding come from? And I'm, I'm talking not necessarily just about money, but also time, you know, time is money as well. So like, if, if you sit down and you say like, I'm just going to build it in my spare time, then you are paying to develop the product. Um, and that's something that's important to keep in mind because it does have uh, important long-term ramifications. If, uh, if you want to be able to support your product long-term, if people want to be able to depend 
on support for that product long term, you need to have a reason to be there long term to support it. And so if you are paying money to uh, develop this product, if you're paying your time, then at some point that time or money runs out and you no longer have a justification for working on it. Like, like I mentioned, the, the dude who uh, cloned my Supercube and released it for free, like I guarantee you he has nothing to do with it anymore. Um, you know, and, and so like this is important to, to really build into your plan at the very beginning. Like where does this time come from? Where does this money come from? And, and there's a lot of interesting options out here to, to consider. Like uh, Dear I Am GUI is a, is a huge inspiration to me. Uh, as far as like you, just like the product, the the way it integrates into things, but also um, the maintainer of that basically does contracts with uh, game companies to add features. Like uh, companies like Blizzard pay him, pay him money to add features to the tool. Now, I've done this myself actually for Fair 2D, even though it was already a paid uh, product. Sega paid me money to add features to that. And so that, that's one way to go that's that's kind of nice. It can be really good. If you are good at uh, like social connections and you exist inside of those environments, uh, this is a really good way to um, get revenue. Uh, the other thing, Patreon is a big visible one. Um, if you are doing something like Patreon or GitHub sponsorships, you probably need to be a little bit of a personality in order to do this. This is very much like uh, almost an entertainment route in, in many ways. If you're doing a tool as well, there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, so you may not need as much personality, but I, I would consider this to be kind of like a personality sort of route. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing to consider. Um, supporting products, peripheral products. Uh, if you have a like a marketplace or, you know, like you have a Udemy course that you charge for, or like you wrote a book or whatever, like that might be an interesting way to support something. Um, if you are building an application on top of it and selling that, and then making the underlying components open source, that's an interesting way to go as well. Uh, it's, it's a nice way to give back. Um, and corporate patronage, like if you work for a company that pays you a salary, like uh, this is my route for, for StereoKit. I did evaluate all these things and I did choose this. Like I had a nice position at Microsoft and I have been able to convince people to, to yeah, give me time to work on this uh, for Microsoft. And so the nice thing is like, that's that's a paycheck. I, I get it every year. It's, it's a predictable number. Like I don't have to worry about like, how do I monetize? Did I hit my targets this year? You know, that sort of thing. So like all of these are different routes to go when supporting uh, an open source product, but you have to support it somehow. Otherwise it's going to die uh, a very sad and painful death. <laughs> uh, and then community. Um, I think every tool that I've built has had some level of community with it. And it's it's just really nice. Uh, for me, I, I really like uh, talking with the people who are using my stuff. It's it's really nice just to see what they're doing with it. It's, it's a nice feedback loop where uh, you get some reward for, for the things that you're doing. It's also, like I mentioned, a really great way to get feedback and everything. Um, Stereokit actually has a Discord channel. And, and thank you, Elper, for uh, like inviting me here. El Elper is part of my Discord as well. Um, uh, you, you get all sorts of interesting opportunities from, from the community as well. The, your community are, are your biggest advocates. This is where you get contributions from. You, know, you can get inspiration from the stuff that they're working on. And like they'll tell you if you're doing the wrong stuff, you know, like oh, why did you do that, or like oh man, this is this is so broken, you know. I like guess having a community is, is really great to to have behind you and check in your work and just to to hang out with. So I, I would encourage you if you are doing uh, something like an open source product, if it makes sense, uh, to have a community to go with it because it, it can be a really really valuable thing. All right, so just to wrap this up a little bit. Uh, just, just the last few words of advice. Just these are the things that I, I think of uh, first. If I was going to give advice to, to somebody about starting an open source product, scope it right. Yeah, be realistic about what you can do with what you have available to you. Um, be intentional about your funding. Like, like I mentioned, this is this is really important for longevity. Uh, you know. And, and that kind of goes along with planning for the long haul. Like what, what is the start? What is the middle? What is the long-term? Uh, have a plan for all of that. Just like know where you're going and then build a community because otherwise it's no fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so that's, that's all I have. Um, that was a solid 50 minutes of me talking. Uh, so I hope that was enjoyable for all of you. 
Uh, I'm on Twitter at Kojaku, um, and you can find all about StereoKit at StereoKit.net. And I think we probably have a few minutes for questions. And I see one up here, so I'm going to take a peek at and see. Uh, all right. So an anonymous attendee asks, uh, if you are using, uh, may I ask if you are using Java for this project, and what language are you using? So um, StereoKit is C and C++ for its core. Um, you can use it from C or, or C++. And I, there are some people writing Rust bindings, but StereoKit's primary method of consumption for as a developer is C sharp. Like I, I ship a NuGet package, it's a C sharp NuGet package, and it's it's really easy to work with from there. And it's the the recommended path for that. Uh, there may be other languages in the future, but C sharp's a golden path. Um, would I have any recommendations for preferable languages to create? Uh, MR and AR open source software. I, I think Rust is a really nice place to go. Like uh, since AR VR is, is a kind of performance critical stuff, using native languages is really nice. Um, and, and Rust is kind of like the, the new hotness. I don't know that I love Rust myself, but I think for an open source project, like it's, it's a very popular language. Uh, I did evaluate Rust when I first started making StereoKit, but three years ago, I did not uh, feel that it was ready for what I was doing. Um, I think now it would be a slightly different situation. Um, so I, I don't know, hopefully that's a, a little bit of insight there. Okay, uh, Chuck says, uh, could you show us how to build a real test or could you show us one of your real test problems as a reference? Uh, I, I don't know exactly if I, if I have a good way to do this here and now. Uh, so if you go to the GitHub, for StereoKit, github.com slash StereoKit, or you can find it off StereoKit.net. Um, there's a whole collection of different repositories in there. Um, StereoKit Inc. is kind of a mix of tutorial and small application that I, I think is really nice um, uh, as far as like an example, as well as a, a test for the, the project. Um, I don't know. Like, yeah, check on the GitHub for, for some of that stuff. That's, that's where most of it is. There's also a lot of really nice samples built into the docs that, yeah. So I, I don't know, hopefully that answers that question. If you want to follow up with that, you could too. Yeah, so that's that's all the questions that I have on my screen right now. Mm -hmm. If anybody has anything else, just uh, feel free to surface it now. We got one or two minutes. If not, thank you very much for sticking around and uh, listening to me chat. Uh, I know that was a lot of words and I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for that absolutely wonderful talk, Nick. Um, it was really informative and beautifully, like the slides were beautifully designed. So thank you so much for all of your time and effort. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and if you are interested in um, in kind of joining the Syracuse community, uh, you can definitely ask me. I can send that Discord link right away. Um, and it's a really fantastic uh, tool to use for building AR or mixed reality applications. So um, if you want to get that kind of head start um, into going into this industry, um, then yeah, it's a wonderful pathway to go through. Um, so yeah, I don't see any other questions. So I, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh -huh. Could I talk a bit about my journey at Microsoft? How's my work experience there so far and the work culture? Um, yeah, so I actually, I really love Microsoft. Um, I, I didn't have to work here um, and I actually turned them down the first few times they asked me to work there. But uh, I met my manager and I really loved my manager and I heard about the product that I would be working with, HoloLens 2. And that kind of sold me on it. Um, like I, I worked with my manager for the first um, four, four years, three years uh, of, of my time at Microsoft. And she was fantastic. Like the whole chain there was just a lot of really nice people. Um, and I, I've moved now over to the engineering team. So I was initially an evangelist and now I'm in engineering. And I've really loved the people here too. Um, like as, as far as mixed reality is concerned, the people who are doing the work and, and the immediate management chain there has been absolutely lovely. Um, and yeah, I've, I've only had the two jobs. Uh, I, I started before the pandemic doing events uh, in San Francisco. And uh, during the pandemic, I, I still did uh, a lot of online events um, 
but I, I spent a little bit more time doing kind of supporting roles, building tools and stuff like that. And so after a while, it just kind of made sense like eh, pandemic events aren't quite as interesting anymore. So let me just move over to engineering and build tools full time. So that was that was kind of my um, career progression here at Microsoft. I hope that's interesting. <laughs> Oh yeah, and um, if you are interested in in doing stereo kits, uh, I, I actually spent at least five years as a, a teacher of game programming, and uh, one of the perspectives that I look at stereo kit as is, would I teach with this? And that's a an absolute yes. I think stereo kit is a really great way to learn programming, and it's is definitely a gentle introduction into um, VR. Cool, cool. Awesome, thank you. Um, if anyone else has any last minute questions, we'll wait a bit more and then we'll wrap up. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for having me on. I, I definitely enjoyed building up this presentation. This is fun stuff was, to talk about. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on today. It was honestly a really, really amazing presentation. So um, just thank you. It was really informative. Yeah, no problem. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, OK. Oh, there we go. Uh, I am not interested in game development, but I will definitely use StereoKit for something else like education. Perfect. I love to hear it. Yeah, like, like I mentioned, it's very much for applications before it is for games. Games is just my background, that's all. So it's, oh. it's targeted towards application developers. You'll enjoy it. So you can also um, kind of from my personal side, um, I've been using StereoKit with a compositor called Monado, uh, which is open source as well on Linux. Um, so if you want to do Linux development, it's a little more complicated, um, to be honest, with all the libraries and getting it set up and everything. Um, but there's a great community for that as well. So they're very supportive and very helpful. Um, if you're interested in that, reach out to me as well. I can give you some contact points. And Nick has a lot of contact points as well. Um, it's very rewarding, to be honest. Like it, It's a wonderful development pathway. But um, it can be tricky, and it does require a fair amount of patience. But as I said, it's fun. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, yeah Linux think... is Linux is not my core development environment. I'm much more of a Windows person, but it definitely works pretty well there. Um, I could probably use a little bit of extra time to smooth things over, but it's yeah, I'm I'm happy with it on Linux too. No, StereoKit works really well on Linux. It's just kind of the kind yeah. of um, linking the different things together um that i struggled with but yeah it, there's there's still pitfalls on linux linux is a tough environment some days <laughs> exactly yeah they're they're kind of fixing it though so it's i think it's gonna That's be a lot okay better. soon i yeah. love linux a lot more than i used to completely agree um okay Another one, one more uh, I need to do a research project at school. Uh, could I ask you more questions through email? What is my email, by the way? Um, so uh, yeah, uh, Stereo is actually great for research. There's um, It works really well for HoloLens research mode and uh, platform for situated intelligence and stuff like that. Uh, or even if you're just regular stuff too. Um, but yeah, please feel free to ask me questions. Um, I'm, I'm usually easiest to access on Twitter or the Stereokit Discord. Those are the places that I would recommend first. If you want to email me, um, my email is nick.klingensmith at microsoft.com. And it's spelled the same as my name here. So nick.klingensmith at microsoft.com. Yeah, if you want to reach out to me after the talk on our Slack channel, um, I can send the Discord invite as well, whoever is asking the question. Mm -hmm. All right. I think that will be all for today. Thank you so much again, Nick. It was great to have you on. Um, thank you to the attendees who came today um, and to anyone else who's watching this recording after the fact. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you again. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.